Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni, I provide of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, and Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered through the website, where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing. The courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention that there is a do-it-yourself DIY course. So this is a course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regimen. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, so that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter your coupon code CW10. Thank you for your support. This episode is brought to you by my former podcast guest, friend and health and sleep coach, Alex Fergus. Alex is a passionate health and sleep coach and has worked with hundreds of clients from all walks of life to help them transform their body composition, health and energy level. Alex is an accomplished athlete representing New Zealand in rowing, winning national bodybuilding titles and breaking powerlifting records. He's absolutely ripped and strong as an ox and has won the Paleo FX Real Fit competition two years running against some of the most fierce competition around. The first time he won the competition training only 15 minutes per week. Alex attributes much of his success to his pursuit of incremental improvement in every aspect of his health and performance. He's one of the most obsessive biohackers I know, constantly optimizing every aspect of his mind and body for better results. As a former chronically sleep-deprived young adult, Alex pays close attention to his sleep and has invested heavily to optimize his own sleep quality for maximum benefit. Alex has devoted much of his time to researching how to optimize sleep, has been featured on numerous podcasts and wrote extensively on the subject. He knows his stuff. With that in mind, Alex is giving away a free four-part sleep improvement series with tips that will revolutionize your sleep quality and help you fall asleep faster to give you more energy, improve body composition and better all-round well-being. To get access to his free four-part sleep improvement series, go to 15minutecorporatewarrior.com forward slash Alex and sign up now. So I'll say that again to get a free four-part sleep improvement series, go to 15minutecorporatewarrior.com forward slash Alex and sign up now. Hello, boys and girls. I am Lawrence Neal, and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. I'm coming at you following my new morning routine, which is currently make bed, 10 push ups, not for exercise, but for air quotes, priming the body, Uh, morning pages, which is kind of like journaling and coffee. This podcast is my mission to understand how to optimize productivity and health, career, business, and lifestyle. My guests include world record holders, medical physicians, biohackers, high-intensity training specialists, former athletes, New York Times bestselling authors, life hackers, extreme endurance adventure racers, and many, many more. My next guest is Dr. James Steele, who joins me for a part three. That's how we do on Corporate Warrior. We go deep and sometimes that requires three episodes or more with the same dude or dudette. If you want some serious nerdery on resistance training and you want to know what the most recent scientific literature is reporting on how to make your exercise protocol more effective, you are going to love this. Dr. James Steele is an associate professor in sport and exercise science at Southampton Solon University in the UK. 
He teaches across both exercise physiology, biomechanics, and research methods, is an active researcher, and has published numerous peer-reviewed articles on a variety of areas relating to health and fitness. He is currently involved in a number of projects regarding resistance training, including its physiological effects, the impact of manipulation of variables within resistance training programs, understanding effort, its measurement and application, inter-individual responses to resistance training, and in particular currently leads the Resistance Exercise and Community Health, that's REACH project, an internationally collaborative project which aims to examine an intervention to increase initiation and maintenance of resistance exercise for public health using a home or community centre-based self-managed approach. James is a brilliant young mind and what I love most about talking with him is his ability to think and discuss with such impressive objectivity. He really is a wonderful scientist who follows the scientific method with such rigour and I feel very lucky to have him join me on Corporate Warrior, especially for a third time. This episode was certainly one of, if not the most progressive in terms of the discussion around optimising hypertrophy, aka muscle gains from resistant training, We review the latest literature on the subject and cover the following. How greater resistance training frequency may produce better results in terms of muscle hypertrophy in trained individuals and how this relates to increased protein synthesis and the attenuation of muscle damage. We discuss the literature on the subject on muscle fiber typing and discuss whether fiber type really does help to tailor a training protocol to an individual. We talk about the pros and cons of not training to failure. James shares his most uh, re- oh, sorry his current workout regimen and diet and how this has changed, if at all. Uh, we touch on myokines and skill training and much, much more. I apologize for some of the audio issues at the beginning of this episode. James is using a shitty mic, uh, which I don't think you might be saying, uh, but we managed to fix uh, fix most of the issues during the podcast. So please bear with us at the beginning because it's really worth it. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to 15minutescorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast. That's the number one five. Uh, very excited to get this one live and get your feedback. So without further ado, please enjoy this podcast with the one and only Dr. James Steele. James, welcome back to the show. Welcome to Corporate Warrior. Thanks for taking the time to come on today. Thanks for having me today, Lawrence. It's always a pleasure. Um, so... Obviously, we, we've been going back and forth on email um, with regards to some of the latest literature that you've been looking at uh, in relation to muscular hypertrophy um, and more specifically frequency, which came up in my conversation with Ted Naiman um, and surprised me, actually. I was very surprised to learn that he worked out so frequently. Um, and with that, there's a bunch of um, studies that I think have been published quite recently that I'd like to... well that you pointed out, um, that we can review together. Um, so the first one, which was the frequency, the overlooked resistance training variable for inducing muscle hypertrophy. Um, now that study hypothesized that increasing frequency may be more effective at increasing muscle hypertrophy. Um, and I just wondered, could you just, for those listening, provide kind of a layman description? I had to read this thing like five times just to understand it. So perhaps provide a layman description, define some of the terms such as trained individual, which I think is quite ambiguous to some people. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, probably worth giving a little bit of context to this anyway. Um, I I was actually one of the peer reviewers for this uh, publication. Now it's been published. I've got no problem with uh, saying that. Usually the peer review process is, is blind, but um, that means that the uh, authors and the reviewers normally don't know who the who each other are, are so it's supposed to be uh, unbiased. But um, but uh, I, I'm I'm all for open peer review. It means there's nowhere to hide. But yeah, I was one of the uh, reviewers for this piece, um, and it was actually from Jeremy Lernecki's, um group, who uh, I believe you had Jeremy on recently. I did. Um, and yeah, so it, I mean, essentially, the the what's being proposed in this this paper is quite an interesting um, hypothesis. Obviously, we've got a lot of research now looking at a number of different uh, variables and their manipulation within a resistance training intervention and what impact that may or may not have upon uh, muscle hypertrophy as an outcome. Um, so it's probably important to say that this this paper is focused on hypertrophy um, as an outcome. 
uh, not necessarily on strength. And I'm sure we'll probably co- comment on um, you know the the associational lack thereof of strength and hypertrophy at some point in our chat today. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, so in essence, what what, what the argument uh, being put forth in the paper is that, that there's actually um, one of the things we found when we published our uh, review paper in 2013 was there's actually a lack of good literature on um, increased frequency, increased training frequency, um, and its effect on hypertrophy, um, particularly in trained in individuals. Is there's very little um, data looking at that. Um, but there's a lot of um, kind of underpinning uh, mechanistic research or, or, or you know theoretical uh, or, or theory we can kind of put together and speculate whereby um, increasing training frequency might be um, something that optimizes the hypertrophic outcomes in a trained population. Um, so, like you said, I think it's probably good to, to clarify what we mean by trained um, and what we mean by untrained. Um, so, trained is obviously quite a, a kind of, it's a term that's difficult to, well, it's not difficult to to, um, uh, to define, but it, it for those who are familiar with the research literature around this area um, or around resistance training in general, they'll often see studies that say that they've been conducted on trained individuals. Um, and you sometimes find that there are different definitions put forth in those papers for what constitutes a trained individual. So sometimes they'll use a baseline level of um, strength. So are they have can they achieve a minimum kind of strength level for them to be considered as trained? Um, there are obviously problems with that in that some people might have trained for years and years and years and never actually get to the minimum strength level required to be considered trained in that study um, but for all intents and purposes they are trained so um, in this paper they kind of consider a trained individual to be someone who has actually undergone a period of uh, resistance tra- training um, and in fact Jeremy and uh, his group published a, another recent paper which I'll, I'll share the link with you Lawrence um, which again I was a reviewer for um, I think it was titled something like um, to infinity and beyond um, or, or it's something along those lines, and it was about um, the time, about. the time course of of muscle adaptation, um, and you know how long before we start to see a plateau in hypertrophy in different muscle groups, and you know what can we consider to um, to or what, what can be used to consider whether someone is trained or not, and I believe they had another paper as well, um, but anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm waffling a little bit there, um, so. In this paper, um, there are a number of kind of useful figures which they use to kind of illustrate this idea. Um, And and a lot of it is based on, um, you know, they're hypothesizing based on um, studies that have looked at uh, protein synthetic response. So obviously, in response to a bout of resistance training, um, you know, there'll be an increase in muscle protein synthesis and and a decrease in uh, protein breakdown um as well um although albeit there will be an initially a rise in protein breakdown but over time that starts to uh um, down regulate um and what you find is in untrained individuals um that increase in protein synthesis is is quite substantial um, but over time um that starts to become more um attenuated um, in a trained population. So a trained population, what you find, or sorry, in an untrained population, what you find is there's quite a substantial increase in protein synthesis. Um, and that protein synthetic response lasts for quite a long period of time, um, relatively speaking, compared to trained individuals. Um, once you become more and more trained, that protein synthetic response um, isn't as large and doesn't last for as long. So what you find is that, or, or the argument that Jeremy and his group are kind of putting forward is that there's the potential that if you can train a muscle more frequently, then you increase um, the area under the curve. So the kind of amount of time that the muscle is spent anabolic. Um, so if you imagine an untrained individual, you'll perform, say you're performing uh, resistance training once or twice a week, that resistance training stimulus will create a uh, an increase in protein synthetic response, um, and that will be quite substantial. Um, it will um, last for quite a considerable period of time, um, and therefore you spend a, uh, a greater period of time um, in a kind of net uh, anabolic um, state compared to a trained individual performing the same routine. So what Jeremy and his group are arguing is that because the protein synthetic response um, attenuates more quickly, and isn't as high in terms of its magnitude in a trained individual, 
that it might be better for a trained person to increase their total train their uh, training frequency whilst maintaining a relatively low volume uh, within sessions so that they're continually spiking that protein synthetic response um, and therefore over over the period of of time, say a week, there's a greater area under the curve um, that means that they're spending more time in a kind of anabolic state. Um, so that's essentially what they're kind of proposing in in this paper, that for, for a trained individual, that a, a greater um, training frequency might be more better because it more reg regularly spikes protein synthesis and that has uh, subsequently should mean that the individual spends more time uh, anabolic, essentially. Cool. Thank you for doing that. That was really good description, just simplified it. It's funny, I didn't even know, I was looking up the word attenuated because I didn't even know what it meant. Uh, <laughs> and, and my understanding is that it basically just means reduction or reduced. Yeah, um, we're, we're pretty good. Why can't you just use that word? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had this discussion before, Lawrence. Uh, researchers and scientists like use it, like using their thesaurus because it makes them sound clever. <laughs> <laughs> um now, this is interesting because obviously it runs counter to a lot of the um, kind of the hit paradigm that, you know, when you get really, really strong, you have to, um, if you're assuming you're, you're, you know, you're following a high intensity training like protocol where you're doing sort of single set to failure and you're training very intensely that you need several days, especially when you get very strong, that you need even more time to recover between workouts. Now, this is almost saying the opposite. So how can you explain that? I mean, you know, it's just because my understanding is that the muscle and the nervous system and all of that requires uh, a certain amount of time to recover from training. And if you're training to, assuming we're talking about training to failure, you know, how is it that one is a, a trained individual is able to um, perhaps see better results in terms of hypertrophy if that's the case? So I think one of the things to um, to clarify it first off is obviously there is obviously individual variability in terms of how individuals will respond to um, you know a single bout of resistance training. So some people will have more or less um, soreness, uh, more or less muscle damage, um, you know, a, a number of um, perceptual and kind of uh, uh, physiological responses to that training bout, and that might influence how. Um, prepared they feel to train um, and so that might have an impact on their ability to train more frequently um, but that being said I, I think one of the things and this is where I kind of depart from the traditional kind of hit paradigm that um, as you get stronger and as you get more trained you need uh, more uh, recovery time in between because I just don't think there is any um, solid evidence to support that that claim um, in fact we as as we highlighted a couple of years back, you know there is a lack of evidence on uh, a lack of good research on training frequency. Um, there's some data suggesting that slightly greater frequency of training per muscle group might be um, slightly better. Um, you know, uh, uh, Brad uh, Schoenfeld recently, well, I say recently, I think it was a year or so ago now, um, published a uh, study looking at full body routines versus a kind of bro split. Um, where it was volume equated. So they were performing the same amount of training per muscle group, but the um, full body group were training their muscles more regularly throughout the week, just performing less volume within that session. Um, and there were there appeared to be greater responses in the uh, in the um, slightly higher frequency. Now, that being said, um, I think it's worth... Th this is where, where I think um, the... The hypothesis that, that Jeremy uh, has put forth around frequency is, is interesting, and I think there's plausibility to it, but I'm also skeptical that it will really make any like meaningful di difference um, for someone who is, uh, has been training for a long period of time anyway. Um, I think that, that over time, you eventually hit your kind of ceiling, and anything at that point is going to make very little Different. So upping your frequency might make the tiniest little bit of difference, um, but it's down to the individual to determine whether that's that's worthwhile or, or, or meaningful. Um, but coming back to the you know the traditional kind of meme in the hit uh, hit field that you know if you're training to failure you need longer time to recover. Um, if you're uh, you know the stronger you get the you need more time to recover. Well, I think there's there's two points to raise there. So the the idea that you need more time to recover because you're getting stronger, because you're handling heavier loads and it has more of an impact on um, 
the joints, uh, you know, the soft uh, passive tissues, ligaments, tendons, etc. Um, there's something to be said of that. There's there's some truth to that. Um, I was at a presenting in Singapore at the World Low Back and Pelvic Pain Congress last year, and uh, Roger Schlepp, who's uh, one of the um, uh, world experts on um, fascia, um, was reporting some uh, research data showing that actually for um, that kind of soft tissue, it that requires a lower frequency of training to optimize uh, or lower frequency of loading to optimize um, kind of uh, protein synthesis in the in the soft tissues. Um, so there might be a trade off between greater frequency to increase muscle hypertrophy versus lower frequency to optimize tendon uh, tendon tendon ligament um, adaptation. Um, but I think one point point that should be made is that um, there's also a mountain of evidence now suggesting that you don't need to lift heavy loads for hypertrophy. So there's nothing to stop someone from utilizing lighter loads so that they're not placing such a, um, a stress on the uh, on the soft tissues um, in order to allow them to train more frequency and potentially reap the um, hypertrophic benefits from that. Um, and what was the other point I made to begin with? Ah, the muscle damage, the the, um, uh, the kind of recovery point point of um, training to failure. Um, so so we we mentioned this in our kind of email exchange as, as well, Lawrence. This idea that, and I know Ryan Hall um, talked a lot, a lot about muscle damage as being potentially important for um, hypertrophy. Um, and I think Jeremy, uh, in his podcast, I remember him saying that he was less convinced that muscle damage is so important now. Um, and I fall along the same kind of view as uh, as Jeremy does now. Um, <clears throat> I was at um, European College of Sports uh, Congress of Sports Science last year when uh, Felipe de Mas, who I believe is one of Stu Phillips' PhD students in Brazil, um, presented some of his data, um, which is now subsequently be published, um, which looked at the relationship between uh, acute protein synthesis, so kind of what we were discussing earlier, um, how much protein synthesis increases in response to a bout of resistance training um, and how well that is related, the magnitude of that is related to the magnitude of change in hypertrophy. Um, And this is an interesting study because a lot of studies prior to this have um, used the kind of design where they'll get a group of um, untrained individuals, they'll put them through a bout of resistance training, they'll take a muscle biopsy and they'll measure how much protein synthesis went up after that initial bout. Um, They'll then train them for 10, 12 weeks and they'll um, measure changes in hypertrophy. And then they'll go back to the data and look at how big the um, increase in protein synthesis to that first bout of resistance training was and how well it is associated with the size of the change for that individual. So they'll kind of run a correlation between the two. Um, and, And most studies show that there's a very poor relationship between protein synthesis, acute measures of protein synthesis and hypertrophy. Um, now, the interesting thing about this um, study by Damas et al. was that they took into account um, muscle damage as well. So in those biopsies, they took um, biopsies over a period of weeks. So they didn't just take it kind of week one during the first bout. They took it after a number of um, – sorry, <laughs> I'm moving away from the mic, I think. <laughs> no worries. You, you can hear me now? I can hear you clearly. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the listeners. Um, yeah, so they, they took repeated biopsies after several um, training bouts. And um, one of the things you get with a repeated training is, is something called the repeated bout effect, which is very well documented. Um, you know, if you perform the same training uh, uh training style over a period of time, you start to reduce the amount of damage that's accrued, um, and that can be measured a number of different ways. Um, Soreness tends to go down over time as well in response to it. Um, So they did this in order to look um, on the, at the kind of uh, muscle fiber level as to how much damage was occurring. So they looked at something called Z-band streaming, um, which is an indicator on that kind of um, muscle fiber level of what, of whether damage is actually occurring. So what they found was, obviously, initially there was quite a high protein synthetic response, but there was also quite high muscle damage. And that initial protein synthetic response to, say, the first bout of resistance training wasn't associated with um, hypertrophy over the training intervention at all. But over time, when uh, as muscle damage started to decrease, um, they started to find that um, protein synthesis in response to the bout of resistance training was more strongly associated with hypertrophy. So 
I think to kind of um, highlight what, what I suspect this means is that during a bout of resistance training, that particularly in an untrained individual, if they're unfamiliar from you know if it's an unfamiliar stimulus, um, that induces a lot of muscle damage. And that muscle damage we know is associated with upregulation of protein synthesis. Um, but it seems as though that protein synthesis in response to the damage is not being directed towards new growth. It's being directed towards repair of the damaged tissue. Whereas the protein synthesis that's being directed towards new growth seems to be predominantly being stimulated by something else. So it's, it, I, I suspect it's likely to be more uh, mechano, you know, the sensing of tension and mechanotransduction, um, upregulating things like AKT and mTOR to upregulate protein synthesis, um, you know, towards new growth as opposed to towards um, new repair. So. What you tend to find is, I think, initially, obviously, for an untrained individual, trained to failure causes quite a lot of soreness. But over time, the vast majority of people find that if they keep doing the same workout, that soreness mitigates, that uh, muscle damage that they experience mitigates. And actually, once you become more familiar with the stimulus, you can probably get away with training more frequently and potentially um, continue to stimulate this protein synthesis that's directed towards new growth. Um, it, it, it sounds a bit cl cliche, but I think that um, you know one thing which the HIT community has kind of um, overlooked is that during training it's about stimulation, not annihilation. But there's a tendency within the HIT community to um, you know utilize advanced techniques, um, utilize things like deep inroad um, and, and other things which will potentially increase the amount of muscle damage. And it feels like you're getting a hard workout, but it might be that that is not necessarily productive for increasing hypertrophy. And we've shown in a number of studies that um, advanced techniques, um, at, at least from, you know, from, from a kind of strength perspective, don't have much of an impact um, there either. And a recent study from, um, again, from Jeremy Lernecki's group and uh, some colleagues in Japan have shown that drop sets um, don't appear to offer any greater hypertrophic adaptations compared to just regular sets to failure either. So I think it's a bit of a misnomer that you have to have extended periods of time to rest um, as a result of training to failure or uh, potentially for using high loads, but then there's the argument that you could train with low loads. I think also just to add, um, the, uh, from what, what, I've, what I've learned, I guess, talking to people about um, advanced techniques is that some people just enjoy the novelty. So they appreciate that it may offer no benef additional benefit in terms of like, you know, adaptations, but they aren't. They just like like it for the novelty. <laughs> they keep them oh, no. interested. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I know you've spoke with James Fisher and and Luke Carson about about this, and I yeah. completely agree with it. Um, you know, I, e e even me, who uh, who they look at as being quite sort of robotic in my tra training uh, programs, every now and then I will uh, use a few advanced techniques just for a little bit of a change and a little bit of you know a, 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 an interesting. Um, I call them my kind of like treat workouts. You know. Uh, they're, 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 they're a bit different to the usual. Okay, so right. So thank you for reviewing and going through both of those studies. That was, that was really interesting. Um, and I think, actually, I think that was gold. I think some of the stuff is going to be really interesting to people. Um, one of the questions I had is, and actually you suggested this, is you know, how does, knowing all of that, how does that interact with the other variables when programming training? So I guess how do we put that in a practical um, framework people to take that information and actually put it into practice yeah so that's a that's a great question and um <laughs> i'm gonna sound like i've got a little bit of a bias hit here but i quite liked uh you know the interview that you did with ted um and i i would tend to from a practical perspective um fall along along the lines of i i would suspect that um you know a very simple um relatively low load so body weight can suffice for this um or or re relatively low to moderate load um full body routine uh, performed with single sets to third failure um somewhere between you know maybe two to four times a week for the vast majority of um individuals is likely to be um if if this is this is uh this is true you know this idea that a greater frequency might be better then I think that is likely the kind of best approach. Um, so I say a kind of 
relatively um, you know, low to moderate load um, with consideration of the fact that if you're training very frequently with very heavy loads, then um, there can be some soreness from that. Um, I think there's a volume component to that as well. So for example, if you're training with heavy loads, but trying to um, get high volume. So what you would see in the typical kind of um, multiple set type routines, um, you know, this is more along the end of the spectrum of what you might see in kind of powerlifting type routines where they're performing, you know, sets of between three and five repetitions with, you know, um, 80 to 95 percent of their one repetition maximum. Um, you know, that's going to be having a greater impact on the um, passive um, soft tissues in terms of, you know, soreness. Um, but uh, I, I think that and one of the things that, that was discussed in kind of Jeremy's uh, paper or Jeremy's group's paper as well, I should really say, say Scott Dankel was the uh, lead author on that. Jeremy is, is always um, uh, quick to acknowledge his uh, graduate students who are a great bunch um, from what I can tell. Um, they do argue that that within a session, you know, there's a minimum volume that you need to to achieve and once you do more volume than that it's just wasted sets um and from my perspective i think that um you know that can be achieved with a single set to failure um they they suggest that potentially you know up to maybe three sets might be fine um it probably makes no no difference if you're time conscious then a single set to fa failure is uh, is likely to be absolutely fine and personally i don't think there's sufficient evidence to suggest that multiple sets um per exercise within a session are you know are um optimal um and it, with regards to kind of other vari variables things like repetition duration um that largely makes little difference as long as you're going slow enough for it to be safe and maintain muscular tension um, it probably makes little difference into uh you know in terms of effectiveness if you're going to failure whether you go fast or slow um so yeah so i think a kind of relatively mod a low to moderate uh, load single set to failure um, approach performed somewhere between maybe two and four times a week is probably um, optimal for trained individuals to maximize muscular hypertrophy um, and I say two to four times a week because that kind of mileage will vary and it gives a bit of a range for um, for people to you know, kind of play around with their own individual responses um, and one of the reasons why you know obviously once a week is, is is quite a low volume in the context of talking about increased volume and its impact on hypertrophy um, but I, I should also say it's, a, it's probably less applicable to, you know, people like yourself, Lawrence, or um, a lot of the listeners. But I did a, a podcast interview last week talking more about resistance training from a kind of public health perspective. Um, and in terms of adherence, um, what we found in a lot of studies is if we, um, particularly if we're looking at a population who are not, um, you know, um, I say I, I'm going to use the term hobbyists <laughs> in the, in this area. No, they're not. They're they're doing it because they think they're they're getting some health benefits from it. They're not doing it because they enjoy it. Um, they're using a slightly higher frequency can actually have some benefit there as well because life can sometimes get in the way. And if they miss one workout and they're training once a week, and that turns into next week they miss a workout as well, then it ends up being a big period of of. Um, of uh, no training so i think having a slightly higher frequency also mitigates the fact that um, a slightly higher planned frequency um, allows for the fact that sometimes you can miss a workout and it really doesn't make too much of a difference cool now i just wondered since you how long have you because i'm assuming you you've because when, when we last spoke you worked out twice a week um yeah. to failure with your bodyweight workout which you showcase on youtube um and when did you start increasing the frequency and playing around with that? So I actually first, when I first reviewed that paper in sports medicine from Jeremy's group, um, I, I spent two weeks having a little play around with doing a body weight workout every day. Um, and I, I dropped the volume and I was just doing a set of push ups, set of pull ups and um, wall sit and body weight squats to failure um, every day. And I must say, for, for, for the first week, I felt pretty good. Um, but then after about two weeks, I realized daily training was, was pretty tough, uh, tough doing that. Um, on top of the fact that I, I do a lot of other activity as well. So I, I, I cycle to and from work, probably cover about um, 70 to 80 miles a week on the bike. Um, but uh, I, I, what I started doing was um, I, I now I still do the two bodyweight workouts a week, um, 
and then I'll um, I think when we last spoke as well um, I was also doing the kind of once a week prehab rehab type session that's right um, and um, I must admit I'll be honest I got a bit lax with that over time because I wasn't having any injuries um, but I did recently uh, re-injure my shoulder <laughs> shoulder um, t- taking part on a uh, kind of inflatable assault course when I went to visit my brother um, so I've got back into doing that and I'm also training, uh, doing my sprint training as well or trying to once a week. Um, so I'm normally, I probably do on average um, free workouts, free resistance training workouts a week now. So I'll do two bodyweight ones and I'll, I'll do one um, more machine based one, which is in the gym where I'll do, um, you know, I'll do a full body routine of chest press, um, pull down, leg press. Um, I might use the overhead press, do leg extension, leg curl. Um, maybe do do um, some heel raises as well, um, and then I'll finish up the session with some more specific exercises for areas where I've had previous injuries, and I'm trying to sort of either rehabilitate or prehabilitate those areas. So I might do a lumbar extension workout, I might do um, some neck, uh, some four way neck stuff, and I'll do some internal external rotation work um, and uh, lateral raises and stuff on my shoulders. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about picking up the frequency you reduced the volume so you were doing like four exercises how do we know like how how can one design a workout to make sure that the volume is not going to be too much let's assume they're doing this switch i'm going to use my me as an example you know i'm really excited about this because i want to i want to experiment doing three to four workouts a week um and how do i know if volume is too much so that's a really good question as well and i i think it's best to start off potentially with the minimum volume, which is what I did. So I was previously in my bodyweight workouts performing kind of uh, multiple, uh, like um, between two and three upper body push, upper body pull, uh, you know, lower body um, work, uh, exercises and core, quite say core torso exercises as well. Um, and because I suspected that doing that full body routine every day would you know, leave me a bit wiped, I reduced that back down to the minimum of essentially um, an exercise to target each key muscle group group just once in that session. Um, I think a lot of it will come down to personal experience and just kind of subjective assessment of your own fatigue levels um, with respect to that. Um, uh, One thing I think is important to say, though, as well, is that I, I think I do still suspect that even though this has got some, you know, interesting plausibility to it, that the uh, return on investment is likely to be very, very, very small. Um, and I'm still, this is why I haven't kind of gone to go to training five or six times a week, because by and large, I think after you've been training for uh, a reasonable period of t- time, you've pretty much tapped out what you're going to get. Um, Jeremy uh, made an interesting comment. Uh, I think it was a bit tongue in cheek, but it's got truth to it. In that, the on Twitter, he said something along the line, lines of the greatest thing he ever did for um, gaining muscle was to grow up. <laughs> and and it's true. Um, you know, you most people have a very limited capacity to increase uh, muscle mass considerably um, once they've reached reach maturity. Um, you know, as you get older and deconditioned, you can return, you can get closer back to what your baseline was and you can obviously increase above your baseline. Um, but for most people, I think that what we probably see in a lot of studies is, um, you know, we, most studies are 10 to 12 weeks long. And over that 10 to 12 week period, um, one training approach might outperform another in terms of the absolute change that it produces. But what you don't see is what would happen if both of those training interventions were continued over a longer period of time. And I suspect that some people will argue that for those studies that show, for example, no difference between single and multiple sets, they would say, well, if it was a year study, you'd start to see differences. I actually think it would be completely the opposite. I think you see smaller differences uh, you know the longer the study went on for because people will get closer and closer and closer to their genetic ceiling and all that really differs between different approaches is probably the rate of improvement that it induces so i would suspect that for um, a trained individual and 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 this this um review that uh, jeremy's group did on um kind of time course of hypertrophic adaptations highlighted that that a lot of the time the 
um, increase in muscle hypertrophy, measurable increase in muscle hypertrophy. Um, plateaus pretty early on. It doesn't take very long. Most most muscles respond pretty quickly. Most people will argue it can take you know 12 weeks for hypertrophy to occur. Actually, hypertrophy starts occurring from as little as two weeks into a training intervention. Measurable hypertrophy. And I, I, when I say measurable, I mean you know um, detectable with MRI, CT, ultrasound. You know the, the tools that we use in research. Um, and that actually it can start to it plateaus a lot earlier than we think it does um anything after that is going to be marginal um, gains and probably noise more than any, any anything um so i i suspect that given a uh, long enough period of time most training interventions you know all, all roads lead to rome essentially in that sense assuming they hit the main principles which is you know train reasonably frequently enough and train hard enough and um you probably <laughs> and train the muscles that you want to adapt and uh and that's probably all you need to do and um, everything else is window dressing i think that's bill's phrase isn't it I've, I've not heard him say that but um but no it sounds like something he would say <laughs> um i know i've done this to death the whole tim ferris geek to freak thing i think we've talked about it before we've talked about it with james and various other people um and it's interesting because when I spoke to Ted last time, Ted Naiman, you know, he said that he feels that actually, you know, muscle growth is very, very little to do with diet. Um, and, you know, there's obviously been some studies to show that, you know, muscle can grow in the absence of um, uh, adequate nutrition, um, was it calorie deficit and that kind of thing. However, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, you know, um, and again, you know, this is probably going to annoy you, me bringing this up, James, but like in the four hour work week, not the four hour work week, the four hour body, you've got um, the case study with Dave Palumbo. I think that's his name, who gained something like <laughs> 10 stone of muscle. Now, my assumption is he was on some sort of steroids, but the, the claim they're trying to make there is that you really can push the envelope with nutrition. You really can um, get hyper, hy you know, muscular hypertrophy or enhanced muscle hypertrophy with more nutrition. Um, and can you just put a nail in the coffin for me? Because for some reason, I, my mind still goes back to that. And maybe it's because of the, maybe it's because in the media, there's still so much in terms of nutrition, helping people, well, people using, you know, nutrition supplements to um, support how they've achieved their gains. And yeah, I just, it's still something that, that confuses me slightly. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, okay. So I was kind of hoping you'd bring up something along the lines of this because I mean, there's a couple of things to to unpackage there before, which which will will kind of deal with that, uh, you know, present an argument against that, um, and not only from a nutritional perspective, but from you know training perspective, from everything really. Um, you know, anecdotes are very powerful. Uh, anecdotes and narrative are very powerful for altering belief and there's you know huge body of uh, psychological research that shows that um now the, a lot of people don't like it when you question their own personal ane anecdotes um but from as i look at things from a research perspective there are a lot of things that people don't con consider so one is um you know how how have they measured that outcome um, what is the uh, expected um, range of error of that measurement? Can the change that's occurred be accounted for by, you know, um, test, retest um, error rates for whatever they've met, measured? And these are all things that we have to consider from a research perspective, but the general public don't think about. Um, and that's probably because, by and large, it doesn't mean much to people because most people are just interested in aesthetics. Um, if you look good naked, then who cares? But you know that that's something that could account account for these these changes that we see now another thing to consider as well is um you know individual responses do exist they you know it's questionable as to how well we understand those individual responses and how well we can predict them but there is evidence for example from um the heritage family study which looked at vo2 max as an example and there's also you know data suggesting this for strength and hypertrophy as well um but it's highly likely that a lot of the anecdotes that you see for what seem like ridiculous claims may well be true. They're probably not, in my opinion, but they may well be true. And they may well just be explained by the fact that um, baseline levels of any measure will have some sort of uh, varied distribution. And it will normally fit a kind of, you know, um, uh, bell-shaped shape curve. 
and what you tend to find is that that people will lie across that curve and those people will also fit somewhere on a separate curve with regards to how they respond to any particular stimulus with regards to the change in that variable so it could well be that you know the, the individual in this case sat at one end of the bell curve in terms of their baseline muscle mass and then they also sat at one end of the bell curve in terms of their responsiveness to any kind of nutritional or training stimulation for that. So what they end up with is what looks like a massive improvement because they're pretty big in the first place. They end up even bigger because, of, you know, because they're, they're a high responder in that, that respect. Um, I, I just think that a lot of these kind of anecdotes are, are, are noise for all intents and purposes. They're interesting. And, um, you know, they're, they they can be quite powerful when the anecdote is um, supportive of, you know, what the science supports um, to try and get people's behavior to change and their belief systems to change. Um, but, um, you know, by and large, a lot of them don't. And so a lot of them kind of um, put forth and, and support ideas that aren't necessarily, you know, worthwhile or scientifically supported. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Here's, here's, here's an anecdote. It's probably not going to be quite as pow powerful. But I think this is an anecdote that supports roughly what the science supports. So it's an anecdote about me. And I've tried lots and lots of different training approaches. And all of them had pretty much the same effect on me. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as exciting and powerful. But <laughs> maybe that's an anecdote that will, uh, will have, a, have a similar effect. I, I saw that I think Fred commented on Facebook, why, doesn't his le why don't his legs grow? To, to a variety of different things, probably because the actual training intervention is is secondary to assuming it, you know, you hit the majority of kind of key principles in terms of effort and, you know, relatively, um, uh, you know, a reasonable training frequency. So as uh, detraining doesn't occur, occur, then by and large, most people are going to produce the same, r roughly the same, same responses, um, you know, and that's not going to change massively if they were to shift to a different training into intervention um it might do but we just don't have the evidence to support that kind of uh conclusion at this point in time at least i don't think we do okay cool so um but going back to nutrition for a second um just curious what do you when people come up to you and ask you james how do i optimize hypertrophy uh, they probably don't say that they probably say how do i get gains or something um <laughs> what obviously you've got your recommendations from a training perspective but what do you say from a nutrition perspective especially when they're they've got preconceived notions of you know what kind of nutritional intake they think they need so i i think you know i'll put my hand up and say and say you know the, the specifics of nutrition aren't necessarily my specific area of ex expertise but i i'm aware of kind of where the majority of evidence is supportive in terms of approaches for optimizing hypertrophy now in, independent of any kind of training approach um increasing protein for example you know protein is, is the key key fit thing thing in this respect um and and as you said earlier there have even been studies um you know one last year from Stu phillips lab that showed that hypertrophy can still occur even in a caloric deficit assuming protein is sufficiently high now that's in the context of a training intervention as well um but to my understanding, um, in a healthy, um, you know, population not performing training, um, increasing protein int intake doesn't have a massive impact on uh, body comp composition um, in terms of gaining lean mass. Couple it with a training intervention, though, then you start to see, you know, added added benefit. So. By and large, the resistance training is the is the key stimulus for increasing lean, lean tissue. Protein is you know increasing protein intake sufficiently is secondary to facilitate um, that new growth that's been stimulated. Um, but you know I I I I, I do like Doug's phrase you know trying to uh, to gain muscle from nutrition in the absence of training is like trying to push with a rope. It's, you know, it's, it's not particularly um, effective in that respect. Now, having said that, it's, um, you know, increased protein intake, for example, is good in certain populations for mitigating atroph atrophy. 
mitigating, attenuating, <laughs> reducing. <laughs> um, in, for example, you know, those who are under bed rest, um, those who are, um, uh, you know, particularly el- elderly, um, they can mitigate that kind of um, atrophy that occurs from um, immobilization or bed rest or from age-related decline. Um, so I'll give you an example. My, um, my granddad is, is just about to turn 89 um, I've been trying to get him to come in and, and train with me for, for a period of time because he's becoming less and less functional. Um, he's not bought into it yet. He's quite, um, uh, he's a little bit anxious about, about coming in and giving anything a try at his ripe old age. Um, but I have managed to get him onto uh, regular daily protein shakes after we had a look at his kind of protein intake. Um, and he was all for that because he was more than happy to have a chocolate milkshake every day. <laughs> um and you know from 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 that perspective i think that's that's probably offering him some benefit because he's he spends a lot of time um you know uh chair bound essentially um and in the absence of of uh, being able to provide what would be optimal training stimulus then increasing protein is going to help um attenuate that kind of um muscle mass loss um but in terms of other, you know, I, th- I think protein is the key w- when it comes to optimizing hypertrophy and making sure that you've got sufficient protein. And most, you know, most guideline lines are somewhere around the kind of two grams per kilogram body mass. Um, some will be more specific and offer recommendations around lean body mass. Um, and I think that's probably um, a, it's better to go by by an estimate of lean body mass for those who are obese Um Whereas for those who are already pretty lean, then going by, um, you know, total body mass rather than lean body mass is is pretty much going to ballpark you where you need to be. So that seems seems quite a lot to me. So if you weigh 72 kilos, let's say, and you're 10% body fat, then you're still going to need like 120 grams of protein to optimize that um, response. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there or thereabouts. I mean, there's always a margin of error anyway. Anyway, and one of the things I like to to get people to think about when it comes to nutrition is to think about it over a period of time. Um, one, because trying to stress about it on a day to day basis can be, you know, lead to people feeling a bit neurotic. And um, but if you know, for example, over a period of a week or a period of a month, you're averaging out at approximately two grams per kilogram of body mass um, in terms of your protein intake, then you're, you know, that's fine. If you've got one day where you're a bit low, one day where you're a bit high, um, it's all within a margin of error anyway, because even the nutritional information on packaging and, and uh, you know, what you might get from dietary you know, software in terms of what the approximate protein, uh, um, uh, uh, the amount of protein in, you know, certain cuts of meat, for example, there's always going to be, it's always a, a rough um, guesstimate anyway. Um, but, yeah, I, I think think optimizing it over time. It's not that difficult to to do to hit those kind of goals. Um, trying to get higher than that is quite hard without supplementation. Um, but you know, it's it's reasonably easy to get somewhere between sort of you know twenty to thirty grams of protein um, you know per meal if you're having smaller meals. You know, say you're having three to four meals a day, or you're you're kind of on an intermittent fasting kind of a two meal a day approach, aren't you at the moment? Um, but looking at some of your meals, you know, you've got pretty high protein insect take on, on most, most of them just by eyeballing it. Um, so I, I would, for you, for you, I would say you've probably got nothing to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, look, I appreciate you sharing your opinion on this because I know it's not your expert, area of expertise, um, but I know that you are very interested in the gains. So I had to ask <laughs> you that question. Um, and just on that, what, what, yeah, what does your diet look like these days? Um, mine is, it's, it's reasonably similar to what we, we previously, um, uh, mentioned. Like I still, I still fast a few times a week. So when I do my body weight work, I, I like to train, uh, fasted. So when I'm, when I'm doing a resistance training session, I'll, I'll fast up until that point. Um, and then I'll, on, on those days I'll follow up with normally, you know, some like maybe a, maybe a protein shake or something like that after the workout. And then probably it's around lunchtime. So I'll eat lunch shortly after that. Um, but I probably, um, I, I, I do tend to have breakfast and it will normally be like yogurt. Um, do you know what? I, I, as I say, say this, who are you in? I, I listened to a recent interview. It might've been the one you did with Ted, uh, Ted Harrison. And he said he has a big bowl of yogurt for, for breakfast with a scoop of protein in it. 
Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> that, that that was that was world changing for, changing for me because when I when I realized you could mix protein into protein whey protein into yogurt um, and it actually mixes in. Like the first time I did that, I chucked it in and stirred it up, and I thought, oh, I've made a mistake here. This is going to go all, gl- all goopy and, and horrible. And then seconds later, it mixed in. Um, so I normally chuck a little bit of extra protein into uh, into some uh, Greek yogurt and have some fruit or nuts or um, something like, like that in there. Um, lunch, my, one, uh, my most frequent lunch that I have is uh, tin sardines on toasted rye bread. Um, one, because it's super cheap. <laughs> And two, because I really like it. Um, and then I'll have a couple of pieces of fruit maybe. And, and dinner varies. You know, we, one of the things I'm quite, I, I quite like to have is like stock dinners. So, um, you know, shopping is always easy to do because you buy the same stuff. Um, you know, it's easy to, to, to then say to the wife, um, you know, what do you fancy for dinner today? And she can pick from a selection of stock dinners. And I know that I've got stuff in the cupboard to, to make dinner that, that evening. Um, so, but, but that, that will vary because, you know, I, I'm, I'm back in the day, I would have been much more kind of militant on, um, uh, with regards to, you know, avoiding grains and, and sugars and things like that. But now I generally, um, focus on kind of protein intake, hitting roughly what I expect my caloric intake should be for that day. Um, and then everything else kind of falls where, you know, where the chips fall, um, and most of the time that ends up being that I, I hit roughly sort of 20% of calories as protein and, and anywhere between sort of like 30 to 50%, uh, carbs, 30 to 50% fat, um, you know, just depending upon what we happen to have eaten that day. Cool. Um, just there uh, bouncing back to, um, training again, um, and just looking at, you know, increasing the frequency of, you know, a single sit to failure type workout to sort of two to four times a week. Um, one thing I noticed is when I just picked it up to probably twice a week is occasionally I would not perform very well at all. So I remember, um, you know, I got on to the dip bars and I started doing some dips and I, I must have reached failure probably before 30 seconds, something like that. Um, and you know, I wasn't, I wasn't making the exercise very difficult. I was doing it how I've done it before. Um, and I remember when I spoke to Tim Ryan, he mentioned to me that there's so many variables that affect, um, your, your workout performance. And it can be quite bewildering for the trainee because you're like, you're looking at it going, oh, okay, well maybe I'm not recovered. But then actually it could be a whole host of reasons why you're not performing that well. Maybe you're not that suitably motivated or you've not slept well or whatever. So how do you manage stuff like that? So when you have a bad workout, for example, in your own life, like how do you um how do you manage it to make sure that you're not gonna, I guess, um, you know, damage your progress or anything like that? Um so so that's an interesting great question. Um I think one thing to 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 point out and kind of get people to differentiate between is, you know, just because you your acute performance in a particular workout is not that good doesn't necessarily mean that it's not provided an adequate stimulus during that workout. It just means that your performance has not been so good. Good. Um, so, you know, if normally you can fail at around the sixty second mark and you're you're fatigued going into a workout and you fail at thirty seconds. Um, does that mean that the stimulus from that 30 seconds to failure has been less than the stimulus from the 60 seconds to failure? Probably not. Maybe. I would suspect prob- probably not. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are so many things that can affect acute performance. Um, and um, I'll send you a, another paper as well. There's a really great uh, review paper um, about uh, what are called threats to inter- like internal val- validity. Um, and what it, what it is, is in this paper, it talks about confounding variables that might affect test performance. And you can consider, you know, the amount of repetitions that you do in any particular exercise as essentially a measure of performance in that exercise. And we often use that as an outcome in, in studies where we might not necessarily have access in the environment we're doing the study in to you know, a, a Medex dynamometer or, a, or a, uh, you know, Cybex or something like that. Um, you know, and we'll often use reps to failure with a particular load at the beginning and end of a study to measure how much strength was improved. Um, 
and there are so, there are so many well documented things that can affect performance in in that um and that can range from you know where your where your head's at going into the uh into the um intervention you know what are the kind of psychological stresses that you're experiencing um you know the uh, ambient temperature um did you or did you not do a warm up um you know some people who don't do warm ups you know still maybe do something before they do do it and 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 maybe because they don't do a warm up they don't consider that that might slightly differ each time they do it um it age can affect it you know how much sleep you've had what time you perform the workout um and, and another interesting thing can be things like um what what you're thinking about during the performance of the workout as well are you internalizing or are you externalizing um a lot of uh, research shows that acute performance is improved by external um focus so focusing on if you focus on trying to get more reps out you tend to find that people perform more reps um whereas if you focus more on uh, you know the internal um goal which might be in this case stimulating the muscle target muscles from the exercise um you know there may be greater muscle activation you know, whether that translates into greater uh, adaptation you know is, is up for debate um but you know even gender can affect it and who happens to be watching when you're doing it as well so if you've done that in the gym or anything like that if that day there happens to be you know a load of uh guys watching you 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 might not perform so well if there happens to be a group of girls watching you you'll probably perform slightly better <laughs> so uh, you know there's so many things that can affect it so one of the things i mean i think we spoke about this last time was this this idea that i i've kind of stopped re- i stopped recording my workouts a few years back now um, and that's for two reasons. One, because of things like this. You know, I know my workout uh, performance will vary on a day-to-day basis, um, and a number of things can affect that. A number of things which I might not have control over. Um, so I'm not too fussed about the actual workout performance, and I don't think people should get too bogged down in that workout performance. Um, you know, and that's not even adding into the things we mentioned earlier, like test retest reliability, and there's a lot of noise and inherent error in it as well. You know, there's just so many things that can affect it. Um, this is why um, there's potentially danger in these kind of n equals one anecdotes, um, and it's why in research you have to have lots and lots and lots of participants to try and smooth out that kind of noise from all of these variables to try and identify what effect the you know what the signal is in response to the variable you're interested in. Um, but also that, you know, coming back to this idea of once you've been training for a sufficient period of time, the gains that you're going to make are so, so marginal that it's quite easy to fool yourself. Um, you know, I, I think it was, uh, it was Richard Feynman that said, you know, the first thing, thing in science is to, is to, uh, um, to not, uh, to not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. Um, it's quite easy to read into to things. So to go in and have a good workout and think, yes, I've got stronger. Or to go in and have a bad workout and think, oh, no, that's going to massively affect my gains are gone. What's going on? I'm losing gains. When really, it's probably just noise. And it's, but I, I, I appreciate that's human nature to, to do that sort of thing and, and focus on those kinds of things. But I, I, I've tried quite hard to, uh, to forego that kind, kind of thing in my, my own personal workouts and, and try to sort of um, coach people on, on, on doing the same as well. Uh, that's really enlightening. Um, I always find it so helpful just talking to you about this stuff. Uh, question from Oyvind. Uh, hopefully I've said his name correctly. Um, he, he asked, what are your views on training not to failure? Um, so for instance, if you've got the urge to train, but not the oomph to go to failure, um, what is more productive? A non- not to failure workout or recover for longer? What's your view on that? So that's that's a really interesting question, and I think that might depend on um, on how well trained an individual is. And the reason I say that is because um, we've at least found in in uh, one study that we conducted that in untrained individuals, um, you know, you could there's more scope to get away with not training to failure because um, you know it's relatively. Uh, it's a relatively high effort anyway, even if they try and get close to failure, but don't ma- don't manage to get there. Um, and you can account, you can make up for that with a slightly greater v- volume. So, for example, if um, we this in this study we had um, untrained individuals perform either um, it was volume matched, so they had um, to perform 25 repetitions of leg extension. Um, one leg performed five sets of five repetitions, 
um, and ne- none of the sets were to failure. Um, and the other group performed the 25 reps in as few repetitions as possible. Um, so it, this is a design that is um, quite often used to try and match the the amount the volume that's performed, just so you can look at the effects of training to to failure versus not. Um, and what we found was that in that untrained population, although there was a slightly greater improvement in the um, group that did train, the leg that did train to failure, um, it wasn't significantly different from the other um, from the other leg. Um, but what we did find is that over the course of like five sets, not to failure, there's an uh, accumulation of fatigue. So by the time you get to the last set that fifth rep is closer to failure than the fifth rep of the first set actually was. So you're actually increasing the amount of effort that you're utilizing during the exercise anyway. Um, and that might have, you know, more of an uh, impact on an untrained trained individual. Um, that being said, we another study that we conducted in, in well-trained individuals, we did find that um, this was using a slightly different design and it was probably a little bit more... Um, what we would say ecologically valid um, and probably more along the lines I imagine of what Ovin's uh, thinking is that uh, we had one group uh, try and predict uh, when they thought they were one rep short of failure and to stop one rep short of failure um, and the other group continued performing repetitions until they actually reached failure um, and we found that in these trained individuals trying to predict uh, one rep short of failure um, meant that there was next to no change in terms of most of the outcomes we looked at whereas there was still change in the group that continued training to failure again that being said trained individuals quite small cha- changes so you know what i would probably say is that um you know if 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 you feel like working out but don't feel like you've got the oomph to do a, a hard workout to failure, then there's nothing. There's no problem with going in and doing a workout not to failure. It's not going to have a negative. It's not going to make you know. None of the people in that study got weaker or lost muscle mass. <laughs> Let, let's just say, say that. So you're not going to lose muscle mass by training. Um, it's um, but it, it's it's not necessarily going to uh, going to add any benefit. But if you feel the urge to want to go in and train, then go in and do do uh, you know do a, a workout where you try and stop maybe one rep short of failure or if you still want to try and get an effective workout in then perhaps you can opt for a strategy whereby you do multiple sets not to failure so that by the time you've got to the kind of last set set you're by default getting close to failure because of the fatigue that you're accumulating so maybe you know uh, somewhere between three and five set sets uh, of the normal um you know loads that you would use trying to stop maybe a rep or two short of failure might be a good way to do that that being said though there's nothing you know there's something to be said of just going you know just taking an extra day off um you know there are studies where they've looked at extended layoffs um of i I think um between two and three three weeks i'll have to fish out the studies um and send them over to you um and what they what they found is that over a, a long enough period of time, even if you take a couple of uh, workouts off and then pick back up into the tra- training, you know, over a long enough period of time, coming back to this idea I mentioned earlier, you still end up at the same, uh, you know, um, end point in terms of your, ad- your your improvements compared to someone who continues training, you know, consistently throughout. So having a uh, period of, you know, having a workout off because you don't feel up for it. Um, then you know there's nothing there's no issue with that the problem is when that missed workout turns into another missed workout and another missed workout and then eventually you start to fall off the bandwagon but i suspect for someone like Ovin, that's not going to be the case no exactly um okay just looking at um the studies that you sent over uh that were in relation to um the muscle fiber type question you had so the question being does the fiber type profile for anything in terms of determining training response and training programming and you were looking at one study can a fatigue test of the isolated lumbar extensor muscles of untrained young men predict strength progression in a resistance exercise program and the other one was the ace genotype may have an effect on single versus multiple set preferences in strength training so having reviewed those studies you wrote me saying that you were skeptical that programming for fiber types might have any value for maximizing muscle gain um and you mentioned how perhaps the subjects and the studies were outliers can you elaborate on that yeah yeah sure so again this is something that um that ryan brought up in his um his talk and, and it's something that comes from you know a lot of the early kind of um nautilus and medics uh work that was written by arthur jones you know he speculated this idea 
um, uh, along with uh, you know Ellington Darden, a lot a lot of hip proponents have have argued that um, fiber type profile might determine um, how someone responds to training, which it may do, um, but that it also um, predicts how might predict how well someone refers to a particular type of training. So the general argument is that if someone is has a kind of fiber type profile where they are predominantly um, type two fiber um, dominant. Um, so, you know, take, take your atypical um, sprinter, um, someone who has a, uh, a lot of type two fi- fiber, um, you know, area in their muscles, they are, um, they, they can produce a very high force output, but they're very, very fatigable. And um, that someone like that would benefit from um, higher force at force output, um, you know, um, more quickly fatiguing exercise like high load load uh, training. Um, and there's the argument that they might um, benefit from uh, less frequent track training as well. Um, there's then obviously the flip side of it is that if someone's more type two dominant, they're more endurance, uh, sorry, type one dominant, they're more endurance based and they might benefit from doing more kind of low load, higher volume, high rep volume um, training uh, approaches. Now, um, one of the things I did quite like, like what Ryan talked about, and I'll also say there is evidence to support this, is that um, if you give someone um, a particular uh, relative load, so let's say, say for example, you did a, a one rep max with someone and you gave them a, or a one rep max with a group of 100 people and um, you then gave all of those people 80% of their individual one repetition maximum and got them to do repetitions to failure. What you find is there's a massive range of possible repetitions to failure they could do. So some people with 80% of their one rep max will be able to get four reps out and they'll fail. Um, some people will get 18, 19, 20 reps out and fail. And this will also differ for, for exercises and muscle groups as well. Um, and the studies that have looked at the, um, you know, this kind of acute performance have generally found that there's a reasonable correlation with the kind of uh, dominant fiber type in those individuals. So those who get fewer reps out typically um, have more type two dominance. Those who get more reps out have um, quite high uh, type one dominance. So, you know, um, what Ryan suggested is quite good at predicting, um, you know, from a practical perspective, it's quite a good test to use to predict, well, you know, roughly what kind of fiber type you are. And most people can probably guess that anyway, you know, um, the thing that I question is whether or not then using that information to match to a particular training intervention will maximize or optimize the uh, outcomes for that that individual. Because on that perspective, and this isn't to kind of question, um, you know, for example, the you know a- a- anecdotes and individual experience, um, but I-, I did like that Ryan did point out um, – uh, repeatedly that the, this is the example he gave i think think the individual who said you know this is probably someone who sits on one end of the bell curve they're probably an outlier um for the vast majority of the population that though i think it probably has very very little impact um so that study you mentioned um one of the things that the um you know the uh old medics research suggested um was something called a fatigue resistance test um and interestingly this is something that um I would suspect probably will uh, have a reasonably good relationship with um, fiber profile, similar to the test that kind of just described where you see how many reps you can do. Um, but no one's actually tested it. Um, so let's just just state that that to begin with. But essentially, the fatigue resistance te- test, and, and uh, we, we have used this in some different studies, but not to look at fi- fiber pro- profile. Um, but essentially, you do a maximal um, uh test on a dynamometer so for example a maximal isometric strength test so measure how much torque someone can produce in a particular exercise um, in the study i sent you over in this case it was isolated lumbar extension um, and then you perform a set of repetitions to failure with you know whatever particular load it is that they want to use um, and then immediately as soon as they finish that set to failure you immediately lock them back in and test the amount of torque they can produce again and you see how much fatigue has occurred um, in that respect Now, uh, there's a few different limitations to point out out for this because we've used fatigue resistance testing in a study uh, recently, which which we've published, to look at how much fatigue different loads produce, how much fatigue, um, you know, things like drop sets and also how much fatigue things like force reps or different advanced techniques induce. Um, And although in general you find a kind of 
you know, a pattern that you'd expect. So high loads to failure, less fatigue than low loads to failure. Drop sets, quite a lot of fatigue because you end up on a low load. Force reps, similar to a high load if you use a high, high weight. Um, but when you look at the individual responses, they are all over the place. So there, there is so much individual variation. So even with the same kind of load, there will be considerably different uh, responses in terms of the fatigue they induce, which might be reflective of fiber pro profile. But anyway, these these tests are often, uh, or, or you know, a lot of the old Medex literature recommended that these tests be used to then tailor an intervention to that individual. So if they show very very little fatigue, then it was argued that you should give that person a light load and get them to do lots of reps because they're quite endurance based, they're type one dominant. Whereas if they have a high amount of fatigue, they're probably um, uh, type 2 dominant, so you should give them a higher load. Well, in this study, what they did, did was, um, you know, they 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 used this, so they kind of categorized people um, based on whether they were high or low fatigue, uh, you know, in terms of their fatigue response to the, uh, the exercise. Um, and then they essentially had everyone do, you know, a reasonably low to moderate load lumbar extension training intervention. And then they ran a... Um, a regression analysis to see what variables predicted um, the magnitude of improvement um, as a result of that training intervention. And what they found what was that the the fatigue response that they produced had next to no predictive value in terms of how well that, those participants did. So, you know, half the participants were probably using what should be a matched intervention um, because they probably showed a high amount of fatigue and they were using a relatively low to moderate load. Um, but in the regression analysis, they found that there was no addition, you know, there was no value to actually using that information to predict whether they would get a high or a low improvement in terms of strength or, you know, endurance and so on. Um, so from a practical perspective, that kind of questions whether or not we have any ability to use kind of, you know, simple test, uh, you know, approaches like what Ryan said to predict what intervention might be useful for, for an in individual. Um, and like, like I said, the vast majority of people sit in the middle of that bell, bell curve. Um, and so probably it makes such a little, you know, such little difference to those individuals that, um, you know, it's probably not worth, worth do, doing in that respect. Um, that being said, that's for producing improvements. If people prefer to train one way versus another, then that, that's, a, that's a good argument for training, you know, whichever way, way you prefer. Um, but coming to this idea, you know, this, this um, study that looked at ACE genotype type. Um, so, you know, um, angiotensin converting enzyme, you know, that's a gene that's been um, looked at with response to um, improvements in strength outcomes to, you know, exercise size, essentially. Um, so different gene variants will be predictive. Um, of that. And um, what we tend to find, 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 you know, this study essentially kind of grouped participants based on, you know, what their, um, uh, what um, ACE genotype they were demonstrated, you know, they exhibited. And they had individuals perform uh, either a single, there was either a control group, a single set group, a multiple set group. Um, so that was kind of one set or uh, I think it was three sets. Yeah, three sets in this uh, study. Um, and what they did was they looked at obviously the responses in those different subgroups for the um, individuals in that study. And what they tended to find was there was a slightly greater improvement in, well, first of all, um, subjects with um, what's called the DD genotype had huge strength gains, which is what would be expected based on the previous research around that, that area. Um, but the, what they found was that a specific kind of uh, genotype type seem to have greater improvements in the uh, multiple set group in terms of their strength development in a particular rep range compared to the single set group. So those subjects who showed what's called the uh, ACE2 uh, um, genotype type or uh, um, uh, II genotype, they showed greater improvements in the multiple set group in strength development in the 12 to 15 rep, uh, max range compared to the uh, single set group, but there was similar improvements in the single set and multiple set group in that subgroup in the eight to 12 rep max group. So I, I look at this, uh, this study, you know, I, I discuss this in, in a lecture I give to my students um, when we discuss inter-individual variations in, uh, in responsiveness to training and, and whether there's information we can use to predict you know, outcomes, We're, because they're all interested in, well, is there anything I can take away and actually use to help me decide what's going to be best for the athlete I'm going to work with or the client I'm going to work with and so on. Um, 
now the problem with this this study is it suggests to me it suggests there might be um genetic uh you know components that influence whether someone will do better or worse on a particular training intervention but it's important to remember that it was only one strength outcome and the other strength outcome they used in the study had no difference between single and multiple set groups for that genotype um that differed and with the sample size that they've used in this this study i mean it's quite a big study for all intents and purposes but when it comes to identifying variables that are predictive of um, a training response you need hundreds of participants to have adequate statistical power to be able to confidently say that this is something that's you know we think is important for training response and um, this study had you know uh, between 31 and 35 participants in each training group so for a training study it's re that's really impressive you know we struggle to get participants for studies um, but for answering that question the sample size is just not big enough and it's entirely possible that that difference between single and multiple set groups for that particular genotype for that particular outcome might be what we call a, uh, a type one statistical error so it could just be complete fluke that they happen to be diff different statistically in that uh, that outcome the difference what i can't remember off the top of my head what the actual uh difference between the two groups were but again it's probably it was but to my knowledge, it was quite small anyway, so it's probably not necessarily a meaningful difference between them either. Um, so I guess to kind of summarize that, that I think individ inter-individual differences obviously do exist. You know, that's a given that you, d you don't really need a scientific study to identify that. Um, but there's two things to think, think about. One is how um, meaningful are the inter-individual di differences? Um, there was a recent uh, paper from um, a guy called Greg Atkinson and Alan Batterham, and they're both sports scientists, but they're both statisticians as well, um, talking about how do you actually identify in a study whether or not there are individual responders or not. Um, and one of the problems you have, coming back to what we mentioned at the start, is this kind of test-retest error, is if you get a group of individuals and don't train them, so uh, but measure them week one and measure them again at week 12, and look at the change between their pre and post variables and then do the same for a training intervention and then look at the change for the pre and post variables you tend to find that the standard deviation for that change is pretty similar between the control group and the training group which suggests that what looks like individual variation in the um in the training group might just be noise from test retest error because you're seeing the same thing in the group that's not done any intervention whatsoever um so that's not to say that inter individual variability doesn't exist it clearly does but whether or not we can get any useful information from it to help us predict and cater you know produce training uh or any kind of interventions is something i'm still quite skeptical of at the mo moment um you know pr precision precision medicine is something that's quite sort of vogue at the moment um and uh someone who who i know has, has been a little bit outspoken against this is a guy called michael joiner who works for the uh the mayo clinic he's a sports uh, sports scientist or sports physician who works for the mayo clinic and and he's kind of made arguments that um you know we just don't know enough about um inter-individual variability um, we also just don't we don't have big enough studies to identify what factors are predicting that inter-individual variability um, you know, to be able to tell whether someone is or isn't a high responder. And, and, and then the next layer is we also then, if we don't have that information, we don't definitely don't have enough information to predict whether someone is a high or low responder to a particular training intervention. Um, and so certainly, you know, for at least from a public health perspective, and I think this applies, uh, you know, across the board, the best thing we can do is look at the studies and look at the kind of mean responses and use that as a guide to say well if on average this intervention seems to be doing better than this intervention or then compared to a control or whatever then we've got a higher probability of producing a response if we go with this approach and not necessarily get we don't necessarily need to get stressed out about trying to optimize or individualize the protocol from the perspective of optimizing uh, you know an outcome obviously individualization should consider um other factors like adherence and you know, logistic factors and things like that um but yeah so i'm this is as i say you know i don't want to discount anyone's kind of anecdotal experience 
Um, certainly, I can, as I said earlier, from my anecdotal experience, um, I don't think I'm a high responder. I don't think I'm a low responder. I'm a somewhat moderate responder who has somewhat moderately responded pretty similarly to everything I've done. Um, so, and, and I would hazard a guess that the vast majority of the population probably fall into that kind of category. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I think, think this idea of um, individual variability and trying to understand um, individual variability from what can predict it and then catering to, to that is is a little bit um, premature at this point in time. Cool. Um, how much do you know about myokines? <laughs> um, not a not a great deal in terms of uh, specifics. Um, you're you're. I'll tell you who the best person to speak to on that, and it might be worth trying to get her on the uh, on the podcast. Is uh, uh, Professor Bente Pedersen. Um, I've. Uh, uh, I, I spoke or she spoke at the Kiza training conference um, in Dresden back in 2015 um, about myokines. You know, she's like the the world expert on myokines. Um, and uh, I, I spoke with her at um, ECSS last year as well. So she's definitely someone worth. Uh, she's very busy, but um, she might be the person to get on, on there. But yeah, the spe- specifics. I'm not I, not I'm not too deep into that literature at the, at the moment, but um I've got, you know, I've got some thoughts on it. On it. Firstly, no one's too busy enough to come on to <laughs> Corporate Warrior, James. Just so you know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that includes you, uh, Dr. Ellington Darden. If you happen to be listening, um, I do want you on the show, and I think you'll enjoy it. Anyway, um, so yeah, question from Mark. I see how much you might be able to add to this. This is from um, Tommy. He said. Um, what is, if there is, an optimal training frequency for myokine secretion? Should we focus more on that rather than just building muscle and strength? Um, although they do go together. What's your thoughts on on that? As a, maybe you could describe what you know of the myokines and how they work, perhaps to set the, set the context. Well, yeah, I'll give the cliffs notes because I don't want to get myself bogged down to saying something that's uh, <laughs> in- inaccurate. But but in general, you know. Um, you know, uh, my, myokines are, um, you know, there is a huge range of different uh, molecules that are categorized as myokines, but very broadly speaking, they can be categorized as, as um, you know, molecules um, that are secreted um, from muscle in response to an exercise stimulus um, that don't necessarily have a direct impact on that muscle, but instead are secreted and have um, an impact on, um, you know, other organs and tissues around, around the body. So they have a kind of, they're, they're essentially molecules that have a kind of endocrine um, effect. You know, a, a, um, hormones uh, from endocrine organs typically have an effect or not necessarily on the organ that secretes them, but on, on an organ elsewhere. And essentially, this is, these are things that are secreted from muscle um, in response to an exercise stimulus and um, or potentially other stimuli and have an effect on other parts of our body and there is as i said it's not an area i'm specifically up to date with um, but there's there's emerging evidence that these you know a lot of the thing a lot of the health benefits that we see in response to exercise we don't necessarily understand why those benefits are occurring so we see you know there, there's um benefits in clinical populations that you might not necessarily think that there are benefits for so for example in cancer patients um, you know there are there are benefits to um, organs and tissues that you wouldn't necessarily expect to have effects upon because they're not being directly stimulated so it's thought that these myokines are having kind of indirect effects on um, other tissues um, as a result of exercise and potentially explain a lot of the kind of more wide-ranging benefits that we see from uh, you know, from exercise. So, you know, for example, um, some of the cognitive benefits that you see from uh, from exercise might be mediated by uh, myokine release um, as a result of exercise. Um, so, I guess, so I guess that that's kind of uh, you know, Cliff's notes uh, uh, of of what they kind of kind of are. And like I said, I would direct the readers to or listeners, readers um, to um, Bente Pedersen's work on that. And I think her talk from Kiza might be up on uh, YouTube somewhere, so you might be able to find that because um, I know that mine was put up on there. But um, I think so- um, I think one of the uh, one of the staff, I can't remember her name, uh, the manager who used to work at Kiza in uh, Mornington Crescent in London, I think she she told me about her and she wrote her name down on a post and gave it to me. I th- Where is she from? Do you remember? Uh, she's from Denmark, I think. 
Okay, because um, yeah, I, I, um, she sounds fascinating and someone who are, I'm definitely keen to explore and perhaps get on the show. Um, so yeah, no, thanks for bringing her name up. Um, I got a question from Bill. This is a serious question, Bill de Simone. Uh, <laughs> he said he's talking about skill training quickly, um, and he said if you're looking to improve a 5k performance, could you only do strength training? You know, should someone for training half marath- marathons skip legs during their strength sessions? You know, what what are your, I guess, views on preparing for, um, I guess, skill based events? I mean, you said earlier you're doing you get back into sprinting now. Obviously, you're, I've seen some of your times actually; they're pretty impressive, very impressive, I should say. Um, so how is it? How should someone approach you know skill based event uh, from a physical conditioning point of view, and also you know becoming very good at the skill? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just quickly add one last thing on the on the previous question because sure. uh, um, the the point I was gonna gonna make was um, like training frequency for something like myokine release. The, the the simple answer is we don't know. Um, that's not something like the manipulation of different resistance training variables has typically been looked at with respect to strength and hypertrophy. You know, they're the key things because most people uh, it, it's normally um, the bros who are interested in in the specifics of how to tweak a resistance training stimulus to optimize those kind of outcomes everything else has been looked at relatively less with respect to most things have been looked at with respect to what does resistance training's effect have what's the effect of resistance training on this not what's the effect of this resistance training versus this resistance training so the the point i was just going to make is that actually um that's an area where we could benefit from a lot greater research um, but it's also an area where i suspect there will be even greater diminishing returns on investment with regards to overcomplicating the stimulus um you know if it's having a relatively little effect on things like uh, you know hypertrophy then i suspect it's probably having a smaller effect on on um, those other outcomes um but on bill's question i did see bill's uh, bill's question on on facebook um so <laughs> I guess the serious answer to this is um, it, it depends on your starting point. Um, so if you take a completely untrained individual, I would spe- speculate that just getting them in the gym and getting them uh, performing a full body strength training routine, particularly with emphasis on the lower body, is probably going to help improve their uh, 5K at K time. Um, whether it's going to have a big enough improvement for them to suddenly become competitive, I suspect not. Um, I think Bill knows the, knows the answer to this great question, re- really. Um, you know, uh, he, he made the point of saying, if it, you know, is there no such thing as uh, as cardio? Um, I, I always that, that's a kind of tongue in cheek headline, I su- suppose. But um, he's just trying you know, to wind you up. Probably. He is. He is. I know. I know what Bill's about. Um, but for the benefit of the other other listeners. So, you know, we we've we've shown in, in review of the literature and we've got some data coming out as well that resistance training provides a very it when performed to uh a high intensity of effort produces a very similar stimulus to potentially induce improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness um if we think of cardio as being something that improves cardiorespiratory fitness and there's evidence that resistance training can stimulate and Im- cause improvements in measurements of cardiorespiratory fitness then resistance training is cardio and Every mode is cardio if you do it right. So there's no point in using the term cardio. So that that's just to explain that tongue in cheek headline. And um, but Bill's quite right. Right, you know what? That our work on that has looked at measurements of cardiorespiratory fit fitness. Um, so things like VO2 max, things like um, lactate threshold, things like you know um, time to exhaustion on a particular um, you know, mode of tra- tra- uh, mode of uh, testing. Um, things like economy of movement, so how much um, you know oxygen is being utilised to produce a particular um, uh, output. Um, we, you know, there is evidence that resistance training improves those factors, and we know that those factors are associated with performance. Um, now, those f- things take VO2 from max, for example. Um, that is associated with endurance performance. So there, there are studies showing it's uh, associated with 5K time trial performance, for example. Um, but that's in um, the the population as a whole. Um, so in the population as a whole, if you can improve VO2 max, you will expect there will probably be 
some improvement in 5K performance. Um, when you take elite athletes, though, that um, relationship disappears um, because other things are much more influential at that, uh, at that point in time. That being said, there's still a lot of research to show that potentially other adaptations produced by um, resistance training, so changes in tendon stiffness um, and things like that might enhance economy of movement and that might affect performance as well. Um, but by and large, I think the, I, I guess the point that, that Bill is is um, trying to get me to say is that you know if you want to improve the physiological components of your cardio respiratory fitness, then you don't necessarily need to do traditional cardio. You can still get those adaptations, those physiological adaptations from resistance exercise. If you want to improve um, the skill involved with that activity that's utilizing your cardio respiratory system, then um, you know you need to perform that skill because there are motor schema related adaptations that will come from performing that skill um so you mentioned uh you know i i'm i'm i've just in the last year and a half i've got back into um competitive sprinting um i'm not as fast as i used to be but <laughs> but um i still do reasonably well um considering you know the the uh relatively how, how fast did you used to be then uh, my my lifetime best was a ten seven two hundred uh, ten seven two hundred. Oh my god, that would that would be quick. Um, a ten seven hundred and a twenty two four two hundred. Uh, but nowadays I run uh, my my best in the last since I started competing again is uh, an eleven five eight hundred and a twenty three five two hundred. So this is pretty quick. Yeah, it's not bad. Bad. I, I still. I, I still place reasonably well in in kind of local, um, you know, and uh, and county kind of level competitions, um, but I'm I'm way well, I'm not going to be uh, at the Olympics anytime soon. Uh, but it's good fun for me. But anyway, the the um, you know, as I said, I um, integrate into my my training week now um, when I can. I should I should add. Um, so I do want to point out I I don't always manage to train every week and uh, and so I quite often rock up to uh, uh, athletics uh, open meets having only managed to train once in like the last month and and still managed to run some reasonably good times. Um, but you know I, I include although my my physiological conditioning is uh, mainly from the resistance training that I perform. Um, I train specifically the skills involved with the sport that I'm do doing, sprinting in this this case. Um, I try and train them, um, you know, as specifically as possible. So, with the exception of you know a, an adequate warm up to try and reduce um, injury from you know such a high impact activity. All all in all, my uh, sprint training sessions involve running maybe between four and six um, you know uh, uh, block starts. And then r maybe running uh, somewhere between four, you know, uh, uh, two and four, either four hundred meters or uh, two hundred meters, because they're the two events that I do. do. Um, and and that's it. So I'm normally done pretty uh, quickly. Um, so the same would apply to you know someone training for any particular sport. You obviously then get the specifics that come in though, depending upon what the um, impact of the particular training you have to do for that sport actually is. So for for example, performing those sprint sessions for me doesn't have a massive toll in terms of um, fatigue because they're relatively low volume. Um, I, I will say when I first got back into it, I was pretty sore after doing those first few sessions. But again, you know that repeat bout effect means that nowadays. You know, now I go down there and do those uh, sessions, and and I, I, I'm absolutely fine afterwards. Um, but you know, Bill gave the example of of uh, of someone training for for a, a, a half marathon. Um, the thing you've got to consider is that training for that specific event is a little bit different because you can't always necessarily just perform that specific event because it has such a a um, decrement on your uh, you know overall physiology and and um, you know. Uh, it induces such a fatigue that it means that you you can't train frequently enough to uh you know to, to be able to specifically perform that event as a training component so you, so the the longer and more kind of endurance based the event gets the more you have to break it down into specific components and try and train those specific components so that your overall training load doesn't get too high and you don't start to um, you know essentially induce overtraining but you do still want to, you know, 5K is a good example because most people can run, you know, a couple of 5Ks uh, a week, you know, train that specific distance and not necessarily overtrain themselves. Um, whereas it gets a bit more tricky when it comes to, uh, you know, performing the longer distances. Um, but for, for those longer distances, you still do have to rack up the miles because um, one of the adaptations I mentioned was economy of movement. Um, 
And, you know, the, essentially that's how much oxygen, how much energy is utilized to perform a particular given output. So in this case, running speed, for example. Um, and there's a number of things that affect that. So I said, obviously, if there's kind of tendon stiffness adaptations, you get greater elastic recoil. So you're having to use less um, muscular, you know, your muscles are having to perform less work to propel you forwards. Um, obviously, there are adaptations at the muscular level to make them more efficient at producing a particular force output with a given energy requirement um and but but also there are the um the actual specific uh, motor adaptations that are associated with basically becoming just more efficient at running um, or performing any kind of skill which will mean that you're able to sustain that output but so you still have to rack up long you know miles in order to get basically more efficient at running and, and uh, optimize that um, the example I always use is swimming. Like I, I'm a, a, because I don't swim very often when I get in the pool, I'm like the most inefficient swimmer ever. And even though I'm, you know, a lot fitter than, uh, than my brother, for example, he can swim laps around me in the pool pool because <laughs> he, he just cruises along nice and easy. Whereas I get in there, there and all I can do is swim at one speed and that's as fast as I can, because otherwise I start, start, uh, sinking. And if I try and go slow, then I have to speed up. And so by the time I've got to the end of a, end of a single length, I'm absolutely knackered because it's basically a sprint for me. Um, but you know, it goes to show if I did that more often, I'd probably become more efficient at it, use less energy to perform that particular output. Um, so I think I've probably waffled massively there. <laughs> no, no, it's really interesting. And um, we got to we got to wrap up. But uh, is there anything else that you want to leave the listeners with? Any sort of lasting advice? A last piece of advice? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think based on what we've talked about, I just reiterate the fact that um, you know uh, uh, this people make this more complicated than it has to be. <laughs> it's actually pretty simple. Um, and everything else, you know, I'll use that term again. Everything else is kind of window window dressing. Um, you know, as long as you're adhering to to some reasonably specific principles and following a kind of evidence based approach, I don't think that um, you know stressing over and making tweaks here and there is going to drastically change someone's um, uh, responsiveness in terms of how they adapt to it. Where I do think there's value in doing that, though, is in trying to make sure that your training uh, fits around your life um, you know unless you're unless for you training is part of your job you know you're a professional bodybuilder you're a professional figure athlete you're an instagram model or whatever um you know for for all the rest of the population training has to fit around you know training training is supposed to complement the rest of your lifestyle um and that's not to say you can't enjoy it because i thoroughly enjoy my training um, and if you enjoy it more you can't do it more but tweak things to try and fit your preferences your lifestyle working within a template that, 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 you know, based on the evidence we know will kind of optimize adaptation. Cool. And what's the best way for people to contact you these days? Um, probably best way is, uh, you know, I, I use Twitter quite a lot. So it's at James Steele, I, I, um, or people can, uh, email my institutional email address, which is james.steele at solent.ac.uk. Thanks. And uh, that will that'll be all on the blog post as well. So to find this episode and all episodes, please go to 15minutecorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast um, and give me some feedback. Tweet me. I'm on Twitter now as well. I have 370 followers or something like that, which I'm very proud of. Nowhere near your, your number, James, I'm sure. Um, and that's at Lawrence M. Neil. That's M for Michael uh, Neil N-E-A-L. It's probably not the best handle either, but that will also be on the blog post. Um, and you can also find Corporate Warrior on Facebook, where we've got a great community of people that are constantly debating and asking questions. And um, so check that out as well. And thank you for listening. James, um, thanks again for coming on for a part three. It's been really interesting. I'm really excited to get this live because I think there's some, you definitely uh, shed some light on some things um, in terms of, you know, the whole muscle hypertrophy ongoing debate, which is just really interesting. So thanks again. It's always a pleasure, Lawrence. Love chatting. Nice one. All right. I'll be in touch when it's live and uh, enjoy your evening. I hope uh, the missus has got a nice meal cooked for you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You take care. Enjoy your evening, Lawrence. You too. Cheers, mate. Bye.
I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, remember to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Skylar Tanner, Dr. Doug McGuff, and Bill Day Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health. These transcripts are not verbatim. Instead, they have been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to pick out what you need fast and get results. To get your ebook, head on over to 15minutecorporatewarrior.com forward slash ebook and enter your email address for instant access.